buried down among the many layers of voices in the mind, is a voice that's always asking a question, what to do next, what to do next. This is because the mind is active. It can't just sit still. It keeps moving, moving, moving. Planning this, planning that, trying to decide when it realizes it has a choice, what the better choice might be. And that's the part of the mind we have to train. Which is why insight is a judgment call as to what's worth doing. There's a very naive idea about insight that all you have to do is realize that things arise and pass away. Things are made out of fabrications. And that's enough to let go of them, any attachment you have to them. Well, it's like knowing that there's, say, there's a picture on your computer screen sexually arousing, and you know that it's pixels. And somehow knowing that it's pixels would be enough to say, okay, I'm not going to be aroused by it. It doesn't work that way. The mind can know that things are put together, and it still goes for them, because it thinks it's worth it. That's part of the dialogue in the mind that we've got to train. We can take another comparison. It's like knowing that food is impermanent, your stomach is impermanent. But that's not enough to make you decide you're going to stop eating. There's something in the needs of the body, the needs of the mind to keep on eating. You've got to look into what makes those needs, what creates them. This is why we have to get the mind still. So it can see these processes in action, but also see cause and effect. When you go for a particular idea or a particular way of thinking, a particular world of thinking, you want to be able to ask yourself, is this really worth it? And when the mind is hungry, it'll say yes, yes, yes to almost anything. So we give it concentration as a food, something to nourish it. Find some place where you can stay. And when the question is what to do next, what to do next, it's always just stay right here, stay right here, stay right here. In the beginning, it requires some adjustment. That's why in the first jhana there's directed thought and evaluation. You're talking to yourself about how well you're staying with the object, adjusting the mind, adjusting the object so they fit together well, kind of hovering around. And do you feel that the object is good enough? You can just be with the object. Just be with the breath. And it gives you something to rest with. Because when you can have that answer, just nothing new, nothing new, just stay right where you are, that is restful. As the Buddha said, there's no happiness, there's no pleasure other than stillness, other than peace. This is what he means. The mind can stay with something for a while. It doesn't have to keep moving on to something else. Of course, this is not perfect happiness, but it's more restful than jumping around all the time. When the mind gets a sense of pleasure and well-being from this, then when the temptation comes to go to something else, you have something better to fall back on. You say, I'm not all that hungry. I don't need something else. I've got some pleasure right here. Why should I go for something that I know has drawbacks? And this is where you want to look at the drawbacks. We talked about this afternoon. It's poisoning the fantasy. You have a fantasy about something. Well, you can remember there, there's got to be a downside to it someplace. Look for it. This is where we have the contemplation of the parts of the body. If someone looks beautiful. We say, well, would they look beautiful if you turned them inside out? No. When you're with somebody like that, you just, the skin is just between you and their internal organs. It's just a very thin skin. Is that where you want to be? Well, you can think about the, the downside of that, and then you can think about the downside of getting involved with somebody else. 
of the downside of whatever it is that you're greedy for or lustful for or angry about when you're enjoying your anger. Learn to see the downside of things that you go for. And John Lee has a great example of poisoning his fantasy. He was thinking about disrobing when he was a young monk. And so one night he went up into the hollow of the jetty there at Wat Sapatum in Bangkok, where he was staying. He said, okay, what would it be like if I actually disrobed? And in the beginning, the, the fantasy is just way out of reality. Here he is, a son of a farmer, and he imagines himself getting married to the daughter of a nobleman. But then reality hits in. Daughters of noblemen aren't very strong, and the kind of life that he would live would require a strong wife. Well, she gets sick after having a kid and dies. Then he has to hire a wet nurse for the kid, and ends up marrying the wet nurse, and then she has a kid of his. And then she starts playing favorites, and things just get worse and worse and worse. He poisoned his fantasy with a touch of reality. So by that time he was done with it, he was feeling a lot less like he'd wanted to, to disrobe, because he realized that there is going to be a downside of all this. In fact, the fantasy is so real that many people have read a John Lee's autobiography and thought that he actually did disrobe and marry the woman. In other words, you have to realize that reality bites. The fantasy is one thing, but reality can come in and show a totally different side. So this is what John Lee says, when you look at something, if you're attracted to it, look for the bad side. If you find it repulsive, well, look for the good side. Be a person with two eyes, not just one eye. So what he's doing here is giving you some new dialogue in your mind when there's that discussion about what's worth doing, what's not worth doing. So you can change your value judgments, make a different judgment call. Because otherwise we see that things arise and pass away, but some of them we say, well, at least when they arise and pass away, they're, they're pleasant. And there's not that much effort that goes into having that pleasure, so I think it's worth it. And this is where the insight into fabrication makes a difference, is when you see that, yeah, there is an awful lot of effort that goes into maintaining just that little skim of pleasure over the surface of something that's a lot more turbulent. That's when you can see this and see that it's not worth it. That's when you can let go. So insight isn't just seeing things arising and passing away, it's seeing things originating and passing away. And you have to look into, well, what causes their origination? And then the next question is, the extent to which I'm responsible for this, is it worth my involvement? Because that's the other thing that's often missed. It, you're putting a lot of your effort into fabricating things. when. The Buddha says that things are fabricated. He's not just saying that things are conditioned. He's saying your experience of things requires effort on your part. This food that you're feeding requires that you do a lot of fixing. Years back we had a dish, it is a palace dish in Thailand, khao cha. It's basically iced rice porridge. It has lots of special little fixings. And it's very much a palace dish, dish because it requires a whole day to fix it. Now, if you're a king and you've got lots of people hanging around the palace with nothing to do with it, okay, that's something you can do with their time. But the general consensus after someone near decided to do it was it wasn't worth the effort. That's well, a lot of what goes on in life. We put more effort into things than we really realize, and the pleasure is very small. But then we turn to dress it up beforehand, dress it up afterwards, and it's the dressing it up before and afterwards. That's where you've got to bring reality in to poison the fantasy, to remind yourself, well, the pleasure isn't all that much, and the effort that goes into it is a lot heavier than you might remember. See, so more and more disinclined to want to go for it again. That's when insight has hit. That's when insight can make its mark on the mind. So 
to look carefully at the dialogue that's going on in the mind about what's worth doing, what's not worth doing, what's really cool, what's neat, what's not neat, what's awesome, what's not, whatever the word is. We're not just on the receiving side of things, you're actively creating things. And the question is, why create a lot of suffering for yourself? So look into the role that you're playing as you create these things, and realize that you're implicated, and that this dialogue in the mind is something you've got to watch out for. A lot of the training, this is why we have practice not only in meditation, but also reading about what the Buddha taught, because he gives new voices to your inner dialogue, or new perspectives. And as you notice, if you read the Pali Canon carefully, one of the perspectives is having a sense of humor, seeing how ridiculous some of the things that there are in the mind that you take so, so seriously. That ability to step back and see the humor in something that you've been taking very seriously, that's a lot of insight right there. Because what it comes down to is at some point you're going to see your stupidity. You're doing things that you knew someplace inside that that wasn't worth it, but you say, well, this is the best I can manage. Might as well go for it. And then you forget all the drawbacks. You just keep going, going, going. But now you see that really was stupid, because you got something better. This is the other point where a lot of Naive thinking about insight comes in, thinking, well, you just learn how to accept things because there's nothing better than this. That's not what the Buddha taught all. There's something much better than what you've been doing. It's through human effort that a totally unfabricated happiness, a totally free dimension can be attained. Once that's been attained, then everything else pales by comparison. Even the first taste allows you to reorder all your priorities and reorder all your ways of looking at things and realize that what the Buddha said was true. That kind of happiness is possible. In fact, at the moment that happiness is simply news, well, allow it to be news in your heart. Allow that possibility to have, have a role in the discussion as to what's worth doing, what's not, what's next, what to do next, what to do next. Let's go in that direction. And get all the voices together so that ultimately they say, yeah, that's the direction we want to go. Like those beehives, when a bee comes in, it's found a place where there's a lot of good flowers, and it starts dancing, and after all, a few more of the bees dance in tune with it, and ultimately the whole hive is dancing in unison. And they all head off. I'm trying to get all the voices in your mind to be in unison, to dance in unison around the idea that human effort can lead to a happiness that's totally unlimited, totally free, even free of the voice of asking, having to ask what to do next, because at that point there's no need to do anything at all. That's where the mind finds real peace.